The theme, as has already been mentioned, is God's holiness. We opened our service this evening with that familiar song about holiness, Holy, Holy, Holy. And I don't know whether you realize, maybe you're not very good at maths, but we, you, we actually sang the word holy 19 times as if we needed to emphasize the fact that God is utterly holy. We can't come anywhere near his holiness. We never will be able to. We're sinners, but we have the wonderful privilege of being able to worship this holy God, to actually have communion with a God who is holy, holy, holy in the extreme. And his holiness, of course, contrasts with the sinful nature into which we are born. We can't do anything about that. My mum was a sinner, my dad was a sinner, I'm a sinner, but thankfully I'm a sinner saved by God's grace. There's a verse in Ezekiel which I'd just like to quickly mention to you. It's Ezekiel 22 and verse 26. And this is what it says. Speaking about Israel, the people of Israel, her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean, and they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths. Now that might have applied to Israel, but it certainly applies to mankind right here and now, doesn't it? People don't distinguish between the holy and the unholy. Perhaps they don't really appreciate the significance of what the word holy really means. To many people these days, the word sin is an unpopular word. Uh, unpopular, yes. <laughs> but it doesn't appear in people's vocabulary. You don't hear people on the street talking about sin. It's almost a dirty word. But when God appeared to Moses, if you go back to that incident in the Sinai Desert, the burning bush, Moses approached this strange phenomenon, didn't he? And what did the voice from the bush say? Moses was asked, take off your shoes because the place where you are standing is holy ground. It was holy because God was in the middle of it. One of the clearest pictures the Bible gives us in our Old Testaments is that of the reading we had earlier from Isaiah chapter 6. And uh, I believe that Isaiah the prophet was greatly privileged in having this vision, strange sort of vision, but he's been able to pass his vision on to you and I today. And in Isaiah 6 and verse 1, it says, the words of Isaiah, I saw, what did he see? I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. His very presence was so, so real in that, in that vision. It was an awesome vision. The sovereign Lord seated on a throne. Who sits on thrones but royalty? And that was God's rightful place as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The place of supreme authority, high, exalted, no one higher. The temple filled with his presence. And verse 2 shows us that above him there were angelic beings crying in worship to one another. And what was their message? What was their cry? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And we're told that the very doorposts shuddered and the temple filled with smoke. It must have been quite scary. 
And this is what he saw. And he admits in verse 5 that he has no right to be there. He feels completely out of his depth. Sinful. There's another picture, of course, a number of pictures in, in Revelation, which give a, a similar glimpse this time uh, to the Apostle John. And in Revelation chapter 4, here's this awesome, holy God, and John has the privilege of looking in through an open door, we're told, into heaven. He's invited to witness the sight, and he sees a throne, and he who sat on it says, that's in verse 1. He's invited to come and see these things. He saw a throne set in heaven, one who sat on the throne, and it describes what he looked like. We won't go into that. And he saw other thrones, if you read on into verse 4. And these thrones were occupied by elders clothed in white. White indicates holiness, doesn't it? Brides very often wear white. Not always. And these elders were wearing golden crowns. There were thunderings, lightnings, lamps of fire. I'm not familiar with these kind of things. There were heavenly beings present, four living creatures, and constant worship and praise being given to this holy God. An amazing uh, vision that, that, that the apostle had. And then in verse 8 of Revelation 4, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Verse 11. The message of the elders goes on to say, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Chapter 5 introduces us to one called the Lamb of God. You're probably familiar with this passage. And it's a lamb which has been slain, sacrificed. And it's obviously referring to God's Son and our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, to whom a new song is sung. This is Revelation 5, verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Verse 12, this is the voice of angels and their cry, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honour and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. I want to go back to that hymn we sang together in just a moment, but let's have a look at our second heading. There are only two headings, you'll be pleased to know. The first was holy, holy, holy. The second, an advocate with God. We actually sang those words in our hymn. Now, most of you know that we, had, we have a background of mission in South America. And uh, I recall with great affection a brother, um, his name was Epifanio Capiwara, bit of a nightmare to 
to pronounce as well as spell, but he was a dear, dear Christian brother. He was an elder in the church of which I was pastor. And I can guarantee that whenever he was called upon to preach or lead a service, one could almost guarantee that among the choice of hymns would be Santo, 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 Señor Omnipotente. The same, uh, just a translation of our English. But this was his favorite hymn. Uh, every time he, he preached, <laughs> he chose this hymn. So I got to know it pretty well, and so did the congregation. But during my preparation for this evening, I was given the title, God's Holiness. I came upon that old hymn by, by Thomas Binney. And I, I have to confess that I, I listened to it a number of times. I couldn't decide whether to use the Westminster Chapel version or the uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle, which was the one we heard in the background. But I tried to sing along with the congregation. And I got to one verse, and I found myself, and I don't normally do this, I'm not a very emotional person, I found myself weeping at the significance of its powerful message. Now it's verse, I think I've got it written here somewhere. Hang on a minute. Here it is. This is almost the gospel in a nutshell, and yet it's contained in one single verse. We've been talking about a holy God. We can't approach this holy God because of our sin. But look what it says here in verse 4. There is a way for man to rise to that sublime abode, an offering and a sacrifice, a Holy Spirit's energies, an advocate with God. This is the gospel, isn't it? This is the gospel message. We don't know how to find God, but there is a way. God's purposed a particular way whereby through faith, confessing our sins to the Lord, faith in his sacrificial work on Calvary, we have the assurance of one day being in God's presence, in his holy presence. There is a way for man to rise to that sublime abode. An offering and a sacrifice a Holy Spirit's energies, an advocate with God. I wonder if that's your experience this evening. I don't know you all, but it might be that there are one or two who have never really taken this step of getting to know God in a personal way. What do we mean by an advocate? I think most of us have got some idea what it means. God has provided an amazing way by which lost mankind can deal with its lost condition spiritually. My sin separates me from this holy God, but I have an advocate with God. I'm glad I have. His name is Jesus. And earlier we, we read from uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, and uh, the verse 13, I think it is, suggests that we prepare our minds for action, setting our hopes on God's grace through Jesus. Verse 14, not conforming to the evil desires that were ours before we came to saving faith. And verse 15, be holy in all you do. Be holy because I am holy. Now, it doesn't come naturally to us, does it, to be holy? It certainly doesn't to me, especially with the, the many things that surround me these days. But whenever I sing that verse 4, and I keep on singing it, whenever I get the chance, I, I turn on the YouTube, and I, I love to hear that verse again, again and again. A Holy Spirit's energies, an advocate with God. So what does the word mean? It's one who pleads for another. An advocate is one who pleads for somebody else on their behalf, acts on their behalf, defends, supports them when they cannot do it themselves. 
We can't become holy by any efforts of our own. It doesn't work that way. But the offering of God's own son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, his supreme sacrifice, his shed blood, the energies of the Holy Spirit, together bridge the chasm that separates me as a sinner from a holy God. It's done. The great transaction's done. One of our hymns says, doesn't it? I forget which one it is. So, God has provided this advocate for me and for you. And through Jesus Christ, we can be assured of forgiveness of sins, salvation, and life eternal in God's presence. Isaiah 35, 8 speaks of the highway of holiness. Highway means a road, doesn't it? But this is a highway, probably raised up. We can walk on that highway. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1 talks about perfecting holiness. Now we're all on a journey if we're serious about this theme of holiness. We need to progress, don't we? And this verse tells us, Paul speaking to the church at Corinth, perfecting holiness. And then Hebrews 12 and verse 10 it says that we may be partakers of his holiness. How is that possible? Actually participating in that holiness which is uniquely God's. Verse 14 of Hebrews 12, and this is my last quote, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue holiness. P pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If it hadn't been for his advocacy, we would never have any hopes of seeing the Lord someday. So that's my theme, the holiness of God. I hope I've been able to share a few meaningful um, thoughts with you don't write off these old hymns <laughs> because in my opinion they're very often far better than some of the, the modern counterparts but we don't discount them either do we now as our program suggests we're, we're going to divide our time between worship praise message from God's word and prayer and at the end of our service we'll be singing Father hear the prayer we offer but we're going to have a time of open prayer feel quite free to pray audibly if you will quietly if you prefer not to but there are a stack of things we face as a church those of you who are church members will be aware of the fact that we're going through a kind of transition period. We have no pastor. We have a moderator who is very unwell. We have two newly elected elders who are still feeling their way, I think. We have a number of new deacons. And let me say this, and I met someone in the park this, only this afternoon when I was walking our dogs, who said that we're, the church is praying for us, someone from the church, I won't mention who it is. They said, we're specifically praying for the leadership of this church. And I think it's absolutely essential that we bathe the present leadership in prayer. Please do that. Take it seriously. We don't know the future. We don't know quite how things are going to pan out. But we know who's going to do the panning for us. And uh, it's going to be the Lord and he's going to make clear the way. So might I suggest that we, we open up this time for praise maybe based on some of the thoughts we've shared together this evening from God's word. Thankful to God for this advocacy which we have through Jesus. And remembering some of the needs of our people. We've got sick folk. We have had one bereavement in this past week. And we need to remember the family there. 
Um, the name of the lady is Jeannie, Jeannie Baker. Her husband David passed away and uh, the family are really feeling the loss. Uh, we've got to work out where and when the uh, cremation takes place, but that's in the pipeline, I believe. We need to pray for mission. Uh, this morning it was pr a privilege to have with us um, our brother, pastor from Romania, and uh, a super translator, wasn't she? She did a brilliant job. And uh, having done it myself from a different language, I know it's not an easy task, but together they, they gave us a, a clear presentation of his life and his testimony. And we need we could pray for him, couldn't we? And the work that Rod is doing and the mission that he's concerned about in Romania. If you're into persecuted church, which I know some of you are, there are new magazines on the rack at the back there. And we certainly do need to pray for God's persecuted people. The cover of the magazine, if you've seen it, is talking about warfare, where there's a warfare being waged by the powers of darkness against God's people all over the world. It's happening everywhere. And uh, we're blessed thus far in that we don't have outright persecution as there is in Nigeria and some of these African nations um, all over the world there's, there's Christians having real real trouble in, in uh, living for the Lord under those circumstances so please feel free to lead us in prayer we're not going to spend too long at prayer but please participate if you feel able and add your amens to the prayers that someone offers so we'll leave this next 10 or 15 minutes in the Lord's hands